Welcome to this special edition of Hello Ethiopia TV. Today, Ethiopian and Eritrean American filmmaker, journalist, actor, and storyteller Salome Mulugeta interviews the vice chairperson of the Republican Party for Colorado, Vice Chair Priscilla Ron. Salome Mulugeta speaks with Vice Chair Ron from the perspective of presenting the story as a filmmaker, storyteller, and journalist. Let's listen in to what Vice Chair Ron had to say. Hello, Vice Chair Ron. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salome. It's so nice to be here to talk to you as well. All right. So, Vice Chair Ran, um, as a Vice uh, Chair of the Republican Party for the state of Colorado, uh, can you please explain to me what that means and entails? Sure. So, I'm elected statewide by registered Republicans in our state, and I have a very simple job description. I basically work at the will of the chair. I do what the chairperson asks me to do, and I step in when the chairperson's not available. Available. But I do wear two hats. One is I do candidate support. And then the other hat that I wear is community outreach. So I am very active at community events that are not necessarily Republican events, but events that happen in the community. I try to be there to talk to people about things that are important to them and show them our support. Wonderful. Wow. Exciting. So I saw an article that you were featured on. It was, I believe, ENA article. And in that article, you say that you support Ethiopians and other nations that basically govern themselves uh, without the U.S. interference. So can you elaborate what you mean by that? Yeah, so um, many months ago, a very dear friend on Ethiopian diaspora who lives here in the Denver area. And she was very, very upset. And she said, this is what's happening in my country. And she wanted me to know about that. And then another friend, Amsalu, called me and wanted to meet with me as well. And so all of a sudden, I was talking with Ethiopian diaspora about the civil war that's happening and just learning that in Ethiopia, they are very, very strong and they are an independent country and a sovereign country. They are confident that they can take care of their own issues in their own country and govern themselves. So the message that I was receiving repeatedly was, we don't want outside interference from any government. We want to take care of our country on our on our own. And I just believe that if that's the will of the people, that should be something that we support and that we need to be very careful about how we intervene in foreign affairs. Okay. So was it... Uh this, was that the first time you actually knew what was going on in Ethiopia when mom may approached Yeah, I you? didn't know anything that was happening in Ethiopia or about the civil war. And that just speaks to the fact that a lot of times we don't get news um, or we don't get accurate news or the news media will decide what they think is important for Americans to know. And it takes that one-on-one -on -one contact, someone in that community within that culture to talk to a friend and say, this is something that impacts not only me, but a whole community it, where we live. And, and the Ethiopian community is, is huge in the area where I live. And so um, it, it took her calling me on the phone one night to explain as much as she could about what was happening in Ethiopia. Wow. So is it your understanding that a lot of non-Ethiopians don't really know what's going on in Ethiopia? Unfortunately, that's the case. A lot of people are concerned about so many other things. When we look at what the news media decides to share about foreign affairs, you know, first it was Afghanistan and, and now it's Russia, Ukraine. These are the things that bombard our news feeds every day. And you have to dig pretty deep and do your own research to find out updates of what's happening in Ethiopia. Okay, so as you know, the midterms are approaching this November, November 2022. So um, in the article, you say something like, let me see, let me read it. You say something like, um, Ethiopians should be heard, you know, in terms of voting. And 
what made you come to that conclusion? Again, I'm just a firm believer of we the people. As a Republican, that's what our Constitution starts with, is we the people. And it's not our place to tell other countries what their priorities are and what they should be. So when Ethiopians say, they'll, um, we want to be heard because we are Americans as well. We are citizens, we're voters, we're taxpayers. We contribute to our communities. We want to be part of the conversation that impacts us because America is a melting pot. We come from all different right. countries. My mother is an immigrant to this country. My husband is an immigrant to this country. I teach immigrants and refugees from all over the world and everyone should be treated with equal dignity and respect and that's how i feel about the ethiopian diaspora so do you believe that uh, in the midterms voting uh, ethiopians should believe democrats or republicans i think that the ethiopian community is very smart and they have had a chance to see how the democrats have responded to them they have had many many conversations with elected officials regarding um the sanctions by this administration and they are already activated and speaking up against the unfair sanctions that the Democrats and this administration have imposed. So I believe based on what I'm being told by the Ethiopian community that they are ready to vote for Republicans because they feel betrayed. Do you think or is it your understanding that the Ethiopian diaspora had a huge effect for, I think it was Governor Yankin's win in 2021? Because you mentioned it in the article. Um, so can you elaborate on that as well, please? Sure. It's very evident that the Ethiopian community came out in massive droves to support Glenn Youngkin in his win. And they were very happy with the relationship that they formed with the governor. And uh, I'm seeing that same response all over the country where there are large pockets of Ethiopians. We're seeing um, large amounts of protests and demonstrations in key places and communications. And, and I know that the the Ethiopian diaspora has not stopped communicating with the Democrats because they still currently are in uh, leadership positions and in positions where they can make legislation. But they are also building very, very close relationships with Republicans all over the U.S. And do you think it's because well, yeah, you've answered it, but you, you really think mainly it's because what has happened between um, America um, and Ethiopia at the moment with the sanctions. Yes, and all this that. is a very serious thing for Ethiopians. When you see your loved ones being killed and murdered and raped and starving, this is a very serious topic. And you have to be very careful when you're a foreign country intervening in a civil war. And when people come and talk to you about what they say is the truth and what they're seeing on the ground and when they complain about propaganda and unfair news reporting of things that are happening, that's something very serious. And so what I'm being told is that the Ethiopian diaspora is very upset and they feel left behind and betrayed by the Biden administration. And so they are going to uh, make a different choice in this November election. What I'm hearing you say is that the Ethiopian community has a significant voice when it comes to voting. So therefore, because they've been disappointed with the current administration, they're actually going to go out and do the opposite. Because in 2020, I think they did go in droves and voted for uh, this administration and got disappointed. So now what I'm hearing you say, they're going to do the opposite and vote for the Republicans. Yeah, th is that this correct? is the power of the people. We, we, are a, um, we are a democratic republic. We have to represent the people in our communities. And so when the Ethiopian community 
feel like they are not represented, then they are going to vote accordingly. And that is a strong message when the Ethiopian diaspora unite and they come together and they are very, very strong. I'm so impressed with how quickly Ethiopians have come together. And so, yes, I, I, I think that this is a big message to anybody who's running for office that they should not ignore the voices of the Ethiopian community. I also want to ask you, I think most Ethiopians believe that they had something to do with flipping the state of Georgia to blue. Have you heard that as well? I have heard this. And um, again, this is an opportunity for people to become more informed and more involved in their governance. You don't have to be an elected official to make a huge impact. So all of these voices coming together saying this is important that we are not going to be overlooked because, you know, when we look historically at foreign relations and foreign policy in Africa, it needs to be updated. It's a little outdated for a lot of people. And it seems that the American government cares a lot more about other areas than they do about Africa. And so the the Ethiopian diaspora is stepping up and using their voice in a in a very powerful way to say we are going to be involved in legislation as constituents. Okay. So also now moving along you've mentioned it earlier on on the sanctions. Agua is what they call it sanction and that's actually uh, implemented currently although i think it's going to end soon but um i don't mean the sanction but agua i think was only until july of uh, 2022 but anyway the biden administration did implement and oppose agua but now we have on the table hr 6600 and s3199 um so my question to you is, do the Republicans believe in these sanctions, HR 6600 and uh, S3199? And uh, we've also heard that rumors that they're actually on hold. And if they are on hold, are they? What does that mean? Does it mean it's going to be canceled or amended? Uh, do you know anything about that? I wanted to ask that. So. Joe Biden is the first U.S. president to threaten sanctions on Ethiopia. He did pass the executive order that you're referring to, uh, 14046. And uh, we have uh, Democrat congressmen who have uh, written bills, H.R. 6600 and S3199, that are currently not moving forward. I believe that HR 6600, the last time it was talked about in committee was in February and um, 3199, that was April, I believe 6th or 7th was the last time that it was brought up. So it appears as though the um, activity from the Ethiopian diaspora has been very, very effective. Um, as far as the support from Republicans, Right now, we are not in the majority in the House. So, Democrats, because they have a supermajority. So, it remains to be seen what Republicans can do to make a difference should we get back control of Congress in the November election. And that's why this election is really, really important. Typically, Republicans with our platform, we don't tend to um, get overly involved in foreign issues that don't involve us. And the America first philosophy where we are going to take care of our country b before we worry about what other countries are doing. And, and that has caught on a lot of people feel like there are a lot of things we need to fix in our country. And that continues to be the dialogue. So I don't see uh, if we if we get a Republican president in 2024, I don't see us getting overly involved, especially if if the if the um, Ethiopian government says to us, hey, we're good. We can take care of ourselves, but we'll let you know if we need your help. You know, I think that we should respect that. I want to go back to the article and then in the article, let me read it. 
you say that you feel that the current administration still kind of has some ties with this administration, the uh, Obama administration. Uh, and for that reason, that's why they're not working with Ethiopians. Um, just explain and elaborate that for me. Well, please. if you take a look at the 16 <laughs> top cabinet members, 12 of the 16 worked under the Obama administration. So there is a lot of overlap in the Biden administration. You're talking about Susan Rice, who is who is the foreign policy advisor, Jake Sullivan, who's a national security advisor, Anthony Blinken, who's a national security advisor, Ron Klain, who was the Ebola czar, you know, and a lot the resurrection of TPLF occurred during COVID. So there's a lot of connections with the Biden administration and the uh, Obama administration. And so you have to take a serious look at why the Biden administration is very blatantly one-sided towards TPLF. Okay. So do you honestly think that because they have people that have worked for the uh, Obama administration that worked alongside the uh, to Mela Zanawi, that they really believe that they need to kind of help the TPLF. That's what I'm um, saying, it, correct? It definitely looks that way because when you have years and decades worth of relationships, I mean, Joe Biden has been in government politics for 40 years. So I'm sure that the relationships uh, in foreign countries like Ethiopia go back even further than the Obama administration. And so when we're talking politically, you know, it causes us to question why is it that this current administration is favoring uh, a political movement that has been designated a terrorist organization? And when you have Ethiopian diaspora who are on the who are here in America and have family on the ground and people who have escaped even to Gray and have come over and said, this is the truth of what's happening and nobody's listening, then we have to question why our government is doing what it's doing. Yeah, so then you follow up by saying in the article there needs to be transparency and in terms of the U.S. government and what they're doing in Ethiopia and other countries, frankly, you say. So how do you think one can have transparency and be open about what's going on? Uh, how do you get awareness out there? How do you educate others? How do you educate, um, in general, the general public? What are some ideas? Well, you may transparency have? comes when you take responsibility for your actions. And in a year, we had this debacle in Afghanistan, and Ethiopia saw how the Biden administration handled that and how it's handling sanctions in other countries. And if you're not truthful, then it really breaks down that trust. And I tend to watch the, um, the White House briefings pretty much every day. And I watch how this administration avoids answering questions and they're not truthful and they try to misguide and mislead. They say that they're about uh, eliminating misinformation, but they allow misinformation. Can people, that is not transparency. So what that does is it breaks down trust. So until that is uh, remedied, there will not be transparency in this government. And it's going to be very difficult for Ethiopian diaspora to vote for Democrats in this upcoming election or to trust this administration. Okay, so then I want to move um along with uh, what you're saying about the aid and being honest, humanitarian aid, right? So Ethiopians feel and believe that when it comes to humanitarian aid, this current administration has not been fair to them. They feel that the, all the aid that has been going on is directly to Tigray, not to the districts where the Amhara districts are. Um, so my question to you, if, if the Republican Party takes control in the House, in the Senate, and goes into the office, the White House, do you think that will change if the war is still happening in Ethiopia? Well, it appears it's very complicated as to why AIDS getting to some places and why it's not getting to other places, because uh, TPLF, 
has control over access to Tigray and the roads. And, um, you know, there are reports where they are blocking aid from getting to other areas like Amhara. And why is it getting into Tigray? Well, they're allowing humanitarian aid to come into Tigray, but not allowing aid to go into other areas. And the question is, who's responsible for that? And the, if you were to look at, again, the news media, left-wing news media, they're blaming the Ethiopian government. But when you hear reports on the ground, people are saying, is TPLF blocking the humanitarian mm -hmm. aid? So we have to make sure that, number one, we are sending aid to the government and that we are doing all that we can to ensure pathways into all areas that are needed. If that means it's coming through Ethiopia, if it's coming through Sudan, or where are the entry points where we can get humanitarian aid where it needs to go, that is something that the U.S. government can look for because uh, that is a reason why the United States will get involved in foreign um, civil wars is the humanitarian piece. That's something that we really care about. And so I know that the American government is committed to making sure that uh, we address those atrocities in the humanitarian aid. Okay, perfect. So do you believe so far they have been, this current administration has been fair when it comes to humanitarian aid so far? You know, it's, that's, again, difficult to see because back to your transparency question, how do we know uh, where, who is or is the United States government giving that aid to the Ethiopian government? Where is that going and how is it being distributed and what are the um, expectations of when we send that aid? So that is a question that I personally have. It's very difficult for me to answer uh, with 100% uh, clarity as to is the U.S. being fair? Um, and so I think that it, it's time for us to ask for some specifics about where is that aid going and who is the government sending that to? Okay. Um, that's a fair answer. So uh, now I want to move on with the Wilkai Red Line District. And that is Wilkai, Agade, and Wuhum, I believe. And um, the frustration that the Ethiopian community is having is that they feel this current administration, when it addresses the Wilkai Red Line, they refer to it as uh, Western Tigray. And Ethiopians feel it's not Western Tigray, it's actually Amhara district. And the uh, State Department has just recently issued a statement uh, referring to that area as Western Tigray. So I don't know why that happens. If you know why that happens, please let us know. Let the people know, let the Ethiopian people know. But the main question is, um, if the Republicans take control, do you think that it will be rephrased and it will not uh, be called Western Tigray anymore? Um, you know, that's, I think, a big question um, for both Ethiopians and Tigrayan people. Well, it appears to me that this current administration is calling it Western Tigray because, once again, they're showing their bias towards TPLF. You know, this is uh, the annexation of uh, Wilkite in that area in 1991, it, you know, that, that was something that it was in history that was not, from what I understand, uh, legally binding. So it's very disrespectful to the people in that area for the U.S. government to constantly call it West Tigray when they are under their own government uh, rule that is not TPLF rule. So I would anticipate that under a new administration, that if the if Ethiopian government says this is not West Tigray, that we will not call it West Tigray. We have a history of uh, making sure that we honor uh, countries and respect their autonomy. So I, I think that that would be something that would be an important distinction and change to be made in the next administration. Okay, wonderful. If the Democrats happen to win, or if they win, if or when they win this midterm, what do you think that will do for Ethiopians? I don't see Ethiopians um, being quiet. 
this is the number one most important issue is their country. And they will demand to be heard. They have been having meetings and demonstrations, and they are not going to back down. That's number one. The second thing I see Ethiopians doing is turning to other countries for their relationships. For mm-hmm. example, China and Russia, they, that, that relationship there, those relationships will be stronger than our relationship with the U.S. And Ethiopians will take their money somewhere else they are not going to be held hostage to the united states government and i see that uh being more damaged if the democrats win and if they decide that they are going to continue down this path to favor a terrorist organization rather than respect the prime minister and the country of ethiopia so last but not least i also read in the article you say that uh, president biden is the first president to actually impose sanction on Ethiopia. Um, You say that in the article, and do you know if that's true and why did he do that? Why is he doing that? Once again, I think it goes back to his foreign policy advisors, Susan Rice and National Security embedded in the Obama administration and those relationships that uh, where they have deep ties to TPLF and they need to be updated and become current with uh, this administration and when we look at how this administration is governing here in the U.S. Democrats tend to rule in a way that divides us. There are a lot of distinctions between race and gender and socioeconomics and those are the things that divide us whereas when we look at ethiopia they are about unity and coming together and that's a really important distinction when we are talking about who we are going to build our relationship with in the next election and that's the one thing that i hear with the hashtag no more no more war no more atrocity no more rape you know, no more division. And then I'm seeing all the African countries saying we're one Africa, one Africa, we want to come together, we're all equal under God and indivisible. And you cannot bring liberty and justice for all unless you treat everybody with the same level of humanity. And so that's why I think it's a great opportunity for Ethiopian diaspora to give us a chance to repair that relationship between America and Ethiopia, and let's work together to bring that unity and prosperity to Ethiopia. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Ron. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for taking the time to come and chat with me. It's been my pleasure, and I pray for peace of Ethiopia, and I send my love to all of you. Join us on this Friday for what's happening in Ethiopia. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share.